Hello and welcome to worship at Cardia Church. My name's Steve, I'm the pastor. If this is your first time, a special welcome to you. We're gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We're gonna have communion after the message, so if you'd like to participate in that, uh, be sure to prepare bread and drink for you and your household. We come bringing our needs. We come bringing our emptiness. We come to Christ in the midst of a world and a season where there are so many needs, so much emptiness. And so in this time of worship, I want to invite you to join me in seeking to be filled with all the, the good things, the blessings that God has prepared for us through Christ. We come empty, we leave full, so that we in turn can be a blessing to the world. To prepare ourselves for worship, I want to invite you to join with me in praying this prayer written by St. Anselm of Canterbury. Let's pray together. Oh my God, teach my heart where and how to seek you and where and how to find you. Though I have never seen you, you are my God and master of my life. You have made me and remade me, and you have bestowed on me all the good things I possess. But you are still the unknown, for I have not yet reached that for which I was fully made. Teach me to seek you, for I cannot seek unless you teach me, or find you unless you reveal yourself to me. Let me seek you in my desiring, let me desire you in my seeking. Let me find you in my loving, and let me love you in my finding. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Now please join me as we sing praise to God.
So there's nothing I can do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am Hello, my name is Leslie Kim, and I am the Cardia Church Administrator. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. 
Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some days I feel as empty as my gas tank when gas is $6 a gallon. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, empty, whether it's spiritually or materially, whether you're looking at your checking account uh, balance and you're thinking that's empty, or whether you're opening your refrigerator and thinking, wow, that's empty or whether you're looking inside your spirit and, and your spiritual life feels empty, where God feels far away and uh, where you just don't feel close to him. You, you're not filled with his spirit the way that you want to be filled. And um, I can relate to that. And I know the disciples can re relate to that because in today's scripture, we find them at empty. They are together. Simon Peter is with um, Thomas and Nathaniel and James and John and two other disciples, and um, they're lost. Jesus has been raised from the dead, but he's not hanging out with them all the time the way that he used to. He, he's appeared twice to the disciples, but that's it. And Peter, in his emptiness, in his lostness, says, I'm going to go out fishing. Because he was a commercial fisherman by trade, that's what he knew, that's what he did, and so he went back to that which he was familiar with, not knowing what to do in the present and in the future. Because Jesus, though he was raised from the dead, you have to understand that the disciples were dealing with a sense of failure because they failed to stand with Jesus when he was being tried and condemned and crucified. In fact, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Peter, the rock, the one who would always brag and boast about how even if all the other disciples left Jesus, Peter would remain, and yet he failed. And so not having a sense of purpose, having lost his ministry, having lost his sense of calling, he goes back 
to what he knew, which was fishing. Except when they go out fishing, they don't catch anything. So not only are they spiritually empty, but their nets are empty. And as a fisherman, if you've got empty nets, then you've got empty checking accounts. And if you've got empty checking accounts, you've got an empty refrigerator. And if you've got an empty refrigerator, you've got an empty belly. So on all levels, the disciples are running on empty. And that's when Jesus shows up. He comes to the lake shore where he had met them first. And he calls out to them, hey, have you caught any fish? And they say, no, we haven't. And then Jesus says, why don't you try the right side of the boat? And this is a callback to the first time Jesus called them. You have to understand, you can, you can read about it in Luke chapter 5. When Jesus calls the disciples the first time around, when he begins his ministry, he does the same thing. He says, put your nets out over here and you'll catch fish. And they did. And so just like that first time, the disciples uh, cast their nets on the right side of the boat. And sure enough, the nets fill up with fish. And when John, uh, one of the sons of Zebedee, recognizes this miracle happening again, he knows that's Jesus who's 100 yards away on the shore. And he tells Peter, Peter, that's Jesus. And Peter, when he hears that it's, it's the Lord, he uh, throws on his, his outer clothing and he jumps in the water and he swims to shore to be with Jesus. The disciples, the rest of them catch up in the boat, dragging a net full of fish, 153. And even with so many large fish, the nets didn't break. And what Jesus is teaching them and reminding them, not only is he calling them again, reinstating their call, but he's also reminding them that he is their provider. These disciples who were running on empty, empty of calling, empty of pur purpose, empty of finances, empty of food. Jesus is reminding them who the provider is. And not only did he allow them to catch fish, he provides breakfast. He has fish cooking there and he invites them to bring some more fish. They get out the bread and uh, they have breakfast together. And this is a callback to the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus fed 5,000 men in addition to women and children with just five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus is the multiplier. He's not only the director of resources, he can multiply resources miraculously. But it's also a callback to the Lord's Supper where Jesus uh, had dinner with his disciples. And in that dinner, he instituted the Lord's Supper, which we're about to celebrate later. And uh, the Lord's Supper represents Jesus giving himself that the the bread and the wine is actually his body and his blood. And so even in our deep spiritual emptiness, the emptiness of sin, the emptiness of separation from God, the emptiness of fear of death, Jesus gives his own life to fill up death so that there's no, no room. Death has no room for you and me when we believe in Jesus. And even though we die physically, we're going to be raised from the dead like Jesus was. And so Jesus is showing himself and establishing himself as Lord of all, and the provider of all, every blessing, every good thing, Jesus is able to provide. So whatever emptiness you're dealing with today, I want you to know that Jesus can provide for you. But there's something that we have to do and be willing to do if we're going to tap into his provision, and that is to obey, to hear and obey his voice, his instruction and to allow him to speak into every area of our lives, even the practical areas of our lives, even areas of our life where we think we know better than him. The fishermen being professionals could have easily said Jesus, um, and even if they didn't know it was Jesus, uh, they could have easily said, hey, you can chill. We know what we're doing and we'll do it our way. They could have said that, except in their emptiness and the lack of success catching fish, they realize that they, are, they don't know everything. And so sometimes it takes an empty experience. Sometimes it takes a failure of a business. Sometimes it takes bankruptcy. Sometimes it takes a failed marriage. Sometimes it takes a failed job for us to realize that in actuality we're empty and that we need God, that we're not the experts, that we don't know everything. And when we come to that place of emptiness, we can allow God to fill us and invite Jesus and say, Jesus, speak into this area of my life. Speak into my marriage. Speak into my career path speak into my 
my schooling, my, my choices, speak into my health, speak into uh, my nutrition, speak into every area of my life because you're the expert. Jesus, you know all things and you're able to provide all things. And so, um, so when we invite Jesus to speak into every area of our life and when we hear his voice and do what he says, we're going to now tap into his provision, his miraculous provision. But why does Jesus do that? It's not just to fill us, but so that we can fill others. He reestablishes Peter, his calling, his purpose. He takes Peter aside and says, you know, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he asks Peter these three times, do you love me? Because Jesus uh, wants to allow Peter to redeem himself. That just as Peter denied Jesus three times, now Jesus wants to give Peter a chance to affirm Jesus three times. And so Peter does. But each time Peter says, yes, I love you, Jesus says, well, if you love me, then feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. And so what we realize is that when Jesus fills us, he fills us to overflowing so that not only are we full, but we can make others full. That there are people in your life that are experiencing emptiness. There's people on the street that are experiencing emptiness, experiencing an emptiness of food. They're experiencing, experiencing food scarcity. There are people in your lives that are experiencing financial difficulty. There are people in your lives that are experiencing a lostness and a spiritual barrenness. And rather than sitting on the sidelines and saying, wow, that's too bad, what Jesus wants from us is to say, hey, let me help you. I've got more than enough for myself. I've got an overflow. I am filled with resources. I'm a resourceful person because I've tapped into the, the divine resourcer of all things, Jesus Christ. So Jesus fills us so we can fill others. All this is empowered and enabled by love. It's Christ's love for us that allows us to love him back. And it's our love for Christ that allows us to love other people. Now, when you think about Peter in this redemption arc that he's been on, what we learn is that Peter loved Jesus because Jesus because Peter experienced Jesus' grace to the full. If you look at Luke 5, at the passage where Jesus, for the, for the first time, calls the disciples and allows them to catch a miraculous catch of fish, this is Peter's response to seeing such a great miracle. It says, Simon Peter saw this. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Peter knew he was in the presence of divinity. And just like many of us, he was terrified. He was terrified of rejection. And he felt like he deserved rejection. He didn't deserve to be in the presence of somebody that was so godly, to be in the presence of God himself. And so Peter said, go away. Isn't that what we do a lot of times when we fall into sin and we feel so guilty? We've done something that we're ashamed of. And we just can't face God and we can't face other people. And we just feel we, we become isolated alone. And we just say to God, Get a, go away from me, God. I'm not worthy of you. But then Jesus says to Simon, he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so P, um, Jesus demonstrates radical acceptance toward Peter. Radical acceptance is is what I feel like the church is called to. In, an, in a day and an age where we are touting tolerance as the highest virtue, I, when I read the scriptures and when I pray, I have to come to the conclusion that we are called to actually not tolerate people. We don't tolerate people. We tolerate things. We tolerate mediocre things like, uh, like mediocre pizza, like, like Domino's pizza. I tolerate Domino's pizza. And I know I'm going to hurt some feelings for those of you who like Domino's. I get it. They're the number one pizza chain in the country. Their app is the best. I love ordering on the app. I love their car side delivery. Best car side delivery. But I'm just going to be honest. Their pizza tastes like the, like the box it comes in. And I tolerate it. I mean, I'll eat it. If you've ordered Domino's, I'll eat some. 
but it's more like I tolerate it rather than enjoy it. And that's what tolerance is, is tolerance is about putting up with things that you don't like. And that's not what Jesus has called us to do for one another. He didn't call us to tolerate people. He called us to radical acceptance. He called us to, to acknowledge that, yes, we're all a mess in different ways. I am, you know, I am a mess. And I'm a bigger mess in my mind than, than any of you are because I know my mess from the inside, whereas I only know your mess from the outside. But even in my mess, in my unworthiness, in my, my frailty and failings, when I come to Jesus, I don't experience rejection or condemnation. I experience radical acceptance where he says, I love you, son. I've chosen you. I've called you and I'm commissioning you to go out into the world and be my representative. And he provides for me. He blesses me. He allows me to experience the desires of my heart as I delight in him. Jesus is so good to me, better than I deserve. And so I just can't help but every day live in wonder and awe and worship and adoration and love for Jesus because he treats me so much better than I deserve. And so I can relate to Peter, this guy who said, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus picked him up and said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And here in John 21, Jesus reinstates Peter to that calling that Jesus never gave up on Peter, even though Peter gave up on Jesus. And so that's what makes Peter love Jesus. That's what makes me love Jesus. And I hope that you'll experience the grace of Jesus in your life, that, that you'll feel the radical acceptance of Jesus for you today. And that in doing so, um, you'll be able to love Jesus. And being able to love Jesus, you'll obey his word. And obeying his word, you'll experience his provision. And experiencing his provision, you'll be able to provide for others. Instead of looking at the needs of the world and saying, man, I wish somebody would do something, or seeing the needs of the world and thinking, I just don't have any resources to help, to change that narrative and to say, no, Jesus can help everybody. Jesus has enough for everybody. I just need to tap in. There are fish out there. I just need Jesus to tell me where to get them. And so when we follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, as he directs us in our business, in our careers, in our relationships, in our spiritual life, we're going to experience an abundance, an overflow out of which we can resource other people. And that's what Jesus wants for you and me. And that's what it means to be a blessing to the world, which is the vision of Cardia. Amen. Amen. Let's now... Uh, Move to Holy Communion. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. As we're about to take Holy Communion together, let's prepare ourselves by confessing our sins. And so I want to invite you to pray with me this prayer of confession. God of forgiveness, hear now the confession of our sins. Our greed and our lust for power create enemies where we should find friends. We fail to offer comfort and aid to those who are afraid and beat down by the burdens of life. We are as blind and willful as Saul to the pain and the destruction of our wrongdoings and our well-meaning crusades. Forgive us, merciful one. Give us sight to see with your eyes that we may bring hope and peace to our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear these words of assurance. God's anger lasts but a moment, but God's favor lasts a lifetime. The Lord forgives our shortcomings and, and sends deliverance through Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now let's continue in uh, an attitude of prayer as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. God, thank you for your mercy, thank you for your grace, and most of all, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We remember that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. 
And after the supper was over, he took the cup. He passed it to his disciples and said, Take, drink. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so we thank you, God, for Jesus. We remember him and his sacrifice. We receive the gift of his body and his blood that strengthens us and fills us and feeds us and nourishes us and forgives us and cleanses us. In turn, help us to be like Christ as we partake of his body, that we could be the body of Christ to the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this bread and on this drink and on every single person who's sharing in this meal. Thank you, God, for the gift of Christ. Thank you, God, for the gift of the Holy Spirit and for the gift of the church, one another, as we are one in the name and spirit of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now I want to invite you to take the bread or serve it to one another with these words. This is the body of Christ given for you. And also offer the cup to one another, saying this is the blood of Jesus given for you. Let's share in this holy meal together. Thank you, God. We receive all your blessings, all your grace, all your provision. Amen. Now let's praise God together in singing.
receive this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Well, be blessed to be a blessing. Go in peace, and we'll see you next time.